Welcome, listeners, to In the Envelope, an awards podcast from Backstage. I'm your host and very famous in certain circles, Andrew Reynolds. Thank you for that warm welcome, famous in certain circles, Andrew Panels. I'm Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage. And as Andrew said, this is In the Envelope, an awards podcast brought to you by Backstage, your guide to the acting industry and the most trusted name in casting. We're here to talk to some of the contenders of the 2017 Emmy race to ask them how to become an award-winning actor. This season of In the Envelope is brought to you by HBO. You know what they call us here at the studio? They call us the, the backstage boys. They do. <laughs> That's so nice. So I was thinking we should start the podcast with Backstage is <laughs> back. All right. <laughs> <laughs> the backstage boys are back for episode two. Yeah. Wait, I really like that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Lotus Productions, for the nickname. <laughs> I'm We're getting, getting a thumbs, thumbs up. up. <laughs> two thumbs up for In the Envelope. Today we have two very funny people who gave us very, very good interview, Uh, one of whom you've already heard, Andrew Rannells, and the other is Aubrey Plaza, who is most known for being hilarious on the NBC show Parks and Rec, but was also in FX's Legion, which I think we've already talked about on this podcast. A number of times. A number of times. It's almost getting up there with Big Little Lies. With good reason, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) It's Big Little Lies. Um, Speaking of which... On the cover of Backstage Magazine this week, we have Laura Dern of Big Little Lies and of Twin Peaks. Um, It's funny because Andrew Rannells talks about loving Big Little Lies in our interview, and Aubrey Plaza talks about loving Twin Peaks, which is a Showtime show revival that Laura Dern's also starring in. So, Laura, thank you for being on our cover, and Andrew and Aubrey, thank you for joining us for episode two. I, I like how you tied that in so completely you there. Gotta plug the magazine every <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> should we should we get right to it? Yeah. This episode is brought to you by HBO's original limited series, Big Little Lies, starring Nicole Kidman, Reese Witherspoon, and Shailene Woodley. Told through the eyes of three mothers, Big Little Lies paints a picture of a town fueled by rumors, conflicts, secrets, and betrayals. For your Emmy consideration and outstanding limited series and all other categories. Andrew Rannells is a star of stage and screen, a two-time Tony nominee nominated this season for Falsettos, and most well-known for his run on HBO's Girls. We talked a little bit about his introduction to on-screen acting, working with Lena Dunham and Judd Apatow on the show, and also starring in the NBC sitcom The New Normal and the state of LGBTQ representation in television. He's also one of Backstage's number one fans, and we're a big fan of him. Here's my interview with Andrew Rannells. I'd more or less let go of the idea that I would ever be on television because my oh, one wow. my one foray into TV was playing a headless stripper on Sex and the City. Oh wow! Um, yeah, and I was like, I don't think this is going to work out for me. <laughs> on the one hand, think... it's like Sex and the City. I know, and then, and then like a headless a... stripper. Yeah, I know. In retrospect, it was good that I was headless. Uh-huh. I think you know what I mean. Like. <laughs> I think it gave it a better <laughs> better appeal. But it wasn't until I did the Book of Mormon that then mm-hmm. that's how I met Lena Dunham. Right. That's how Girls came about. They had just uh started filming their their first season. They'd shot the pilot, they were got the pickup. Um and around the time that the Book of Mormon opened was when they were Amazing. starting that first season. And you first appeared in episode three, episode I believe. Episode three, yes. And you had just truly I mean, this was at this point years ago now, but that is a truly unforgettable scene for oh. me, like for everyone. Thank you. It's, I mean, it is for me since it was my first like spoken oh, words sure. on I television. Mean, so I was yeah. very excited. And yeah. we were all like, all the Broadway community, of course, was like, there's that kid from Book of Mormon. We love him. Yeah. But you just blazed into this show with that incredible line delivery of the line. <laughs> Your dad is gay. <laughs> um, and you know what? That's all Judd Apatow's doing. I mean, I uh, was mm-hmm. so. Um, I was very nervous, but it was, mm. it, you know, looking back, it could not have been a better introduction sure. to acting on film because I was just sitting with Lena Dunham at that bar. Mm-hmm. She and I had this very strangely natural chemistry mm. that we just like hit it off right away. And 
I think when Judd sort of realized that we were playful with each other, that Lena and I were mm. really working well off of each other, he would just come up to us and whisper oh. little things oh, cool, cool, to cool. sort of, you know, change the scene, improvise different ways, like make fun of her outfit, say something about her hair. And then he said to me, oh. he was like, do you know the actor Peter Scolari? And I said, I do. And he was like, well, he plays her father. Because, okay. you know, the pilot hadn't aired. Then, yeah. um, <clears throat> so he said he plays her, her father. He was like, do you think you could figure out a way to work in that you think he's gay? Oh. Oh, so, so it I was wasn't like, necessarily okay. a written... No, so we did this whole very strange, oh. like, roundabout um, uh, improv that actually the whole thing made it into the scene. Whoa. And then that was my brilliant... Um, Final line. Yeah, contribution was, can you slip in that you think he's gay? And instead I just said, your dad is gay. Um, so maybe <laughs> not the shot. maybe not the subtlest <laughs> of choices. But the most memorable. And, and of course, then you have the... The fabled, what every certainly every backstage user wants of you are a guest on a TV show and then you eventually become a regular. I know it was really. I didn't believe them. I finished that first day and they said, "Would like to have you back," and I was like, "Sure, you would," uh -huh. um, but just didn't think that they would do it. And right. then they just kept calling, and I was like, "When is? When are they going to so find fun. out that I'm? This is all a hoax." <laughs> right. um, but I just yeah, they kept having me back and. You know, Jenny Connor and Lena Dunham and Judd Apatow, they were so generous with me. I was still doing the Book of Mormon, so that was mm. put a lot oh, yeah. of limitations on how often I could be on set. Um, the second season we started, I, I booked a pilot called The New Normal for Ryan Murphy and NBC that I went away and shot that whole 22 episodes of, yeah. a, of a show. And then the second it was canceled, they called me and said, do you want to come back to Girls? Okay. Um, is, so it was strange nice. because it just like bookended, like girls yeah. just bookended that experience. Yeah, And they've been so, you know, as we were saying before we got started, I, you know, have still been able to do shows. I was able to go into Hedwig and Hamilton mm -hmm. and, and this past year do falsettos on Broadway that they worked around my rehearsal schedule. I was rehearsing while we were wrapping up the, the final season. So... Um, two very different projects, sure. but um, but Lena and Jenny were so supportive of of making that work for me, and they knew how important keeping my foot on Broadway was. So that's um, amazing. Yeah, it's amazing that you that you're Tony nominated for this amazing show. Congratulations! Thank you very much. While you, you while you're rehearsing that, you were finishing up. Elijah had a very large role in the last season of Girls. Yeah, yeah, and to get to do um, it was our seventh episode in this season. Um, called The Bounce, yes. uh, that I sort of got to use my musical theater <laughs> skills yep. uh, and talked, you know, we had talked about Finally. it for a couple years and yeah. it just never really seemed like it was the right time. Right. Because that's a lot of characters to juggle. You know, you've got a lot of, mm. you've only got so much real estate in a 30 minute show. So mm -hmm. um, they found the space. Um, they asked me about my early audition experiences. Um, I told them some terrible stories, including one. About, uh, about auditioning for Lissa Strata Jones, right. which um, was a, bas a basketball Lissa musical. I booked it yes. um, miraculously. I'm not sure how. Um, but then, I mean, the audition was a nightmare. And then I got to relive that. <laughs> Like, um, oh, it seemed like verbatim, screen. like the way that you described Pretty close. rolling out the basketballs oh, for the dance audition and the, the worst. kind of reaction to that. The worst. But Richard Shepard, who directed that episode, I think did such an amazing job of, you know, tonally it, didn't totally feel like girls. It felt like a mm. sort of a different show I for agree. a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think he handled it very carefully because mm -hmm. we we're balancing that you know the home life of of Hannah and then Dill coming in and sort yep. of invading their space. But then also doing this weird sort of step out thing with me that didn't really. It's uh, you know it's characters we hadn't seen before. Totally. It's a side of Elijah we had not seen before. It was so bottle episode esque. Almost. Yes, yes, almost. And just this... Lightly bottled. This broad <laughs> comedy that was so well done. It's a beautifully edited episode. Yeah. It's really well done. And But then at the end, it is about auditioning, and it is about the hope inherent yes. in any of that. Yeah. And at the end, he really is rewarded for it. And not only back. yeah auditioning, but also like auditioning, quote unquote, like in relationships, like putting mm -hmm. yourself oh. out there and mm -hmm. like sometimes getting rejected and sometimes not feeling great yeah. about it. So I liked that, you know... Elijah wasn't um, t so uh, uh, strong and and stoic with Dill that he like completely rejected him. Like right. he made his case, but then he still had sex with him. So it was <laughs> right. like, <laughs> right? He got a little of both. And that's the great. I feel like that's the great thing about Elijah is that he, you can just see him. St his, he's making his way, and yes, he's he's got this blustery confidence and this snark 
and it's it's formidable snark, I think. It's a lot of snark. But you are able to weave in this this self discovery that yeah. evolves over seasons, and not just in relation to Hannah. There's an early, I think it's a season two episode where you're saying it's all about you, it's all about Hannah, which is of course a little bit of a meta commentary, yeah, correct? Yeah. Well, yes, and I think that you know, to Lena's credit, she never made any of us feel like we were just there to right. further her story along. Mm-hmm. You know, I think we all felt like we had our own things going on. And cool. And certainly the way that Elijah, I, I think, was written and the way that I was given permission to play him was as if he was the lead of his own show. <laughs> yeah, cool. That was going on. Oh, cool. Even though we didn't get to always see I it, like I that. think that when he was, whenever he was around, he imagined that he was the Carrie Bradshaw. And he was not. Right. Yeah. He and was maybe in that's charge. what's interesting about that. The bounce episode is that he is for that episode. Yeah, he's his world. he gets to be the carry. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like his his musical theater aspirations were always there throughout the show, but never. No, we never really talked about it. I mean, and we he had was a, discouraged. We had a couple jokes about like doing Rent in college with Marnie, yeah. which is still a production <laughs> I would love to see. <laughs> Basically, Al- Allison Williams doing anything in Rent, yeah. I would love to see. Yeah, totally. Um, but uh, yeah, so we sort of talked about it, but it was nice to really. Just go all in. Get in there, yeah. yeah. And Murray Miller and um, and Tammy Sager, who wrote the episode, I think did mm-hmm. a, a great job of sort of taking pieces of what I told them, but also making it not Andrew's story, but Elijah's story and sort of sure. still sticking with the girl's filter. Yeah. And I think also making it every every backstage user's story. That is a very yeah. typical. It really captured the world of auditioning. Well, it was, you know, it, that's a it's a... Not a hard thing, but a specific thing to explain that open call process. Yeah. And I think that, you know, our writers, bless them, um, are not from the theater. So I think that they were oh, sort cool. of baffled by like, oh. wait, what happens? <laughs> um, and I was like, no, it's really that bad. Oh, yeah. Like you just, when I think about some of the things that I had like to do. Zoo. Yeah. Yeah. You just line up and wait for day, like hours, standing around for hours like, waiting for. Please. Yeah. Give me. Yeah. And then just screaming at the top of your lungs. like (laughs) For 16 seconds. Yeah, for 16 seconds, just like belting as high as you can. Right. Oh. That's great that you got to do that, too. You you went a little bit viral with your, that clip of you singing from Smash. (laughs) My bold, my bold choice. Well, (laughs) Jenny Connor had asked me, she was like, well, what did you use to sing for auditions? And I told her all of the, and it was pretty standard musical theater stuff. And then it just hit me that I was like, why don't I just (laughs) sing? A song from Smash, like yeah. that's re- it's, it's a great song. I was, you know, I Christian. And I had already started to do sort of like some pre press for falsettos. Mm-hmm. He was in Smash. Yeah, um, I'm friends with a lot of those people who are in Smash. It seemed like a very strange for the handful of people who like knew about my sort of Broadway background and knew what was coming up and knew mm. who Marissa Jarrett Winokur was yeah. and you know, like. All of it was like a very strange thing. And we got Mark Shaman. He actually came and visited the set that morning when I oh. was singing the song. Oh so gosh. Mark came, and which I was so terrified. Oh, yeah. But it was like 8 <sighs> o'clock in the morning, and I was singing that song. Um, he just stopped by? Or? He stopped by. Marissa told him that we were filming it, <laughs> and I had reached out to him just to say that we were doing it, and thank you for yeah. letting us do this on the show. I see. And then he came by. He came and like watched me do it live. Amazing. Yeah. It's pretty crazy, and that's the thing about girls that I, I, and I'm, I guess I'm learning from you now that it's so much more improvisation based than, but it's also very much grounded in Lena Dunham's real life experiences and in several other cast members' real life experiences, sure. and to create an entire episode around Elijah that's mostly based on an anecdote of yours. It's pretty it, crazy. And most of the shows don't do that. No, and I think, um, I mean, I'm certainly, I feel very fortunate as an actor to have had that input into shaping the character and shaping Mm. that episode and um, so grateful to them that they let me participate in that way. Um, They've always been very generous about inviting us into the writer's room and, you know, talking through our arc for the season and talking about details. But but this final season, they really um, Mm. just gave me a great gift of letting me participate in that. So Amazing. and so I want to ask, too, about your relationship with awards in general. Okay. <laughs> and your thoughts, because, <sighs> correct me if I'm wrong, you will be competing in the category of supporting actor in a comedy. Yes, For I, this final season. I of will, course, yeah. Which means that you submit one episode. Yes. Correct? Correct. Is it fair to assume that you submitted the bounce? That is correct. It seemed like sort of a 
What if I was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> right. So was um, there a thought process behind that? or? No, I mean, you know, I think that uh, if you're going to submit an episode, you, mm-hmm. you know, submit one that obviously you sort of have the most uh, Biggest, time in. So it sure. seemed like that made the mm-hmm. most sense for me. Um, yeah. I mean, it's always, it's a crazy, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very nice that in our sixth season that people are even mm. talking about us like we're considered for such things yeah yeah because that's not always the case so it's it's um it's it's great i mean it's it Mm -hmm. feels nice that we're still sort of a part of the conversation yeah i mean i'm i'm always curious about how that factors into the work like obviously it is first and foremost about the acting and about Mm -hmm. the craft and about creating this character but after it's all done and after it's wrapped and you need to promote the project you have to promote any project you're in Mm -hmm. because you want to get it out there sure but for a long-running show like this that it did receive more awards attention earlier in its run. Mm-hmm. How do you approach the last season, and who do you work with, and how, what does that entail? Like, do you sit down for podcast interviews, of course, podcast interviews, magazine um, interviews, and yeah, I mean, you know, I think HBO sort of has their uh, strategy sort of down to a science at this point. Sure. So, um, you know, we're talking. I mean, but uh, you know, obviously, like the work comes first, mm-hmm. right? And I don't think anybody was sort of expecting. Um, us to be as considered as we are or to even be talking about it. So mm. I think that final season, we were all just sort of focused on wrapping things up in the best way possible and and, and really honoring our previous seasons and, mm. um, and also enjoying ourselves in that time. You know, it's our last time working together. It's our last, you know, season playing these characters. And I think we all, um, I was very proud of how present everybody stayed uh, yeah. in this process. And I think we were all, you know, very grateful for the experience and it's given us all so much. Um, it was everybody's first television job with the exception of Zasha, who had worked a bunch, uh, but mm-hmm. everybody else, like nobody had really That's so cool. done anything or too much. Yeah. So to get to experience that together as a, as a cast, as a group of people was, um, was very exciting. And how cool also that you got to, it did only last a season, but the new normal was a, a year of your life or more. It's like nine months. That you were the lead in a network sitcom. It was a very interesting um, uh, year for me Mm -hmm. because I had finished up Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. I had done the first part of season two of Girls um, and then went right into a very large scale network television show for Ryan Murphy. So very different uh, working with HBO and Lena Dunham and having sort of the luxury oh. of time to film those episodes and and the luxury of, uh, you know, being able to improvise and being able to play around and have oh. conversations. And, and, you know, on network television, the schedule doesn't really allow for that mm. because we had to make 22 episodes yeah. in a short amount of time mm. and you have five days to shoot an episode, whereas on Girls we would sometimes take, you know, seven to eight, depending on what wow. we were doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, There's not as much time for that collaboration no. between the actors and writers. No, we had a really g- talented group of writers um, and fantastic directors on that show, um, really great directors, but I just, there just wasn't time. There yeah. wasn't time, yeah. And then, so what is it like to, this is another thing that happens with all working actors. You attach yourself to a, I guess, TV project yeah. and it doesn't get picked up or it's... Yeah, Sometimes it doesn't yeah. get canceled after two episodes, so at least that I know. Didn't happen. At least we got to have our baby on that show. Um, right, right. You know that was it was tricky. It was it was something that I didn't really allow myself to think about as it was happening. Mm-hmm. We Ryan had had you know huge success with Glee, huge success yeah. with American Horror Story. Um, mm-hmm. The pilot script of the New Normal was uh, was I thought fantastic oh, and yeah. and so smart and clever and kind of dark and. Um, and, you know, it gets run through a lot of filters mm. um, when you're working on a network with a large studio. And so things, I watched the tone of that show sort of shift and change. And, and even though it wasn't that long ago, I do feel like at that time in 2012, there was still pressure on Justin, Bartha, and I to be like poster boys for mm. gay parenting. And that's really not what Ryan the story Ryan wanted to tell or the story that we wanted to tell, it wasn't about us being perfect parents right. or perfect humans. We were very Just flawed humans. and like yeah. making a mess of a lot of things. And hmm. and I think, you know, a lot of people didn't want to see that. 
<laughs> How interesting. Yeah. And this is, I don't want to get on a soapbox or anything, but this is where like representation and media yes. <laughs> really comes into play because yeah. you just want to play two dads who are trying to make it as, as dads and make a family. Yeah. But because there aren't enough other gay dads on television, mm-hmm. of course you're expected to be, you're, people are going to label you as the poster boys. And of yeah. course. Well, and I think that there was a little bit of an expectation from some people that maybe this was going to be like a version of Modern Family where like mm. Cam and Mitchell have their own show and that's just not who we totally were. Totally different team of people. It was a very yeah. different team of people. The jokes were very different. Yeah. Um, Ellen Barkin was playing a really dark, that's dark, the dark. character yeah. um, that we were always up against. It was just not, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't going to be, be a commercial other. for gay parenting. Mm. Um but we did. It was a great experience, and I'm I'm so grateful that I had it, and then grateful to Lena for uh, immediately yeah. when that was announced that the show was not being picked up for a second season. Season, she called me. That's nice. It was like just come back to New York. That's really sweet. Right now. Oh yeah, because so you were in LA. Anyway. I was in LA. That's awesome that you had dark that days to go back to. But yeah, it seems like it's all about the timing, and it's all about the lack of just LGBT representation in media. Yeah, and it's certainly getting better. It is getting better. And I think that your show, it it took us two steps forward. And yes, maybe there's one step back by having the by having it only be one season, but yeah. that's another kind of chink in the armor of I yeah, thanks for saying that. I, I I'm very proud of the work that we all did on that show and I think that um if it's remembered or when it's remembered, I think that people I still get people who tell me that they, you know, watch it on D V D or sure. they watch it on Hulu or whatever. Like that they it's it's found an audience that yeah. I think is, yeah. um, um, which I'm happy for, particularly young people. I like when y- young people yeah. watch it and tell me that they've, you know, see themselves in it or see what m- their future Absolutely. might be like. Mm-hmm. Um, but I get, I, I get asked that question a lot about, cause I've played, you know, a few gay characters and mm-hmm. there's always that pigeonhole question. Right. Don't you feel pigeonholed? Don't you feel like, isn't that so limiting? Yeah. And I think that that's... Are you worried that you'll never work again? It's such a short-sighted question because it implies that every gay person is the same. Right. And that there's only (laughs) one way to play a gay person. Right. So if that, like, that's, it's, that's not reasonable. That's, that's, you know, what is that? What does that mean? Why would that be limiting to me? And yeah. that's it goes back to Elijah because Elijah's so not just the gay best friend. No, he's not even necessarily. He's not even a good gay. friend. <laughs> <laughs> he's not but, even nice to those girls. No, I mean no one on that show is particularly nice to each other. But no, that's true. No, and he's he's super flawed and he's super nasty and yeah, he's not a poster boy at all. I don't no, think. <laughs> no, and I you know I I take flack from that. I had recently. Mm. Um, yeah, recently from a gay publication, someone like wrote a little article about oh. how Elijah is detrimental to the yes, and how mm-hmm. it, like he's the type of character that like makes you hate being gay. And I was Ooh. like, oh god, oh god, really? Ugh. Is it that bad? <laughs> is it? And that I hope bad? you didn't think it is that bad, right? You're no, not, you're not affected by this. No, I'm narcissistic enough to be like, <laughs> that's not for me. That has <laughs> nothing healthy. to do with that's me. That's not narcissistic. <laughs> that's healthy. That's good. And then. Talk to me a little bit about it's your last appearance on the show. It's the second to last episode. Mm-hmm. Elijah books it. I booked it. I booked it. I booked it. I got it. Isn't that to amazing? To quote the comeback. <laughs> I got it. Well, I got it. Um, <laughs> it was amazing. And I wasn't sure if it was, I really wasn't sure if it was going to go that right. way. And they and they weren't sure. They weren't sure if it was going to be stronger for him to not get the job. Gotcha. Um, and uh, were you part of that decision or... I wasn't really. No. I mean, I was cool either way. Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be either set him on a path to sort of, you know, find what his purpose is going to be and Mm -hmm. what his focus is going to be. Or, I mean, either way, that was going to be the ending, right? Like if he got the job, if he didn't get the job, he had this renewed um, vision of what his future was. Mm -hmm. But I I liked that they gave him a win because he hasn't really won on that show. No. So it was nice after six seasons to have him get like... A nice win. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you some rapid fire. Oh, dear. F- answer from the heart. This is where I get into trouble. Questions. <laughs> I want to get you into trouble. This is when the problems start. You yeah. Guys. You f- feel free to say something scandalous that we can. Oh, promote. dear. All right. All right. We got to put ourselves on the map here. <laughs> um, <laughs> who is, as of this moment, your favorite actor? Oh, dear. That I've worked with or just like in general? In general. 
Um, I, I mean, I, I because I had such an amazing experience with him, Christian Borel really cool. changed the way that I like act. I really? Say. Oh, how so? Yeah. He's just so still and present, and he makes everything so easy, and there's no muscling or sweating. Like, you don't have to work very hard. It just You just sort of allow yourself to do it. And it's and it feels a little scary at first, but we had such a great rehearsal process with James Lapine, and then mm. I don't know every night on stage it just felt like a very like a living, breathing romance that we were able to just slip into, and mm. then when the show was over, we were done with that. But um, he's really remarkable, and I um yeah that that has sort of changed my whole perception of acting. Yeah, yeah, it's all about chemistry with uh, yeah co-star like that i mean lena's the same sure, way i was gonna say yeah I, I i think i open up in a much different way when i'm in a scene with her and you never know who who's gonna have that connection with you yeah. as an actor right you don't you just gotta work this, with i really people. hijacked your um rapid fire because that was not rapid it's like i was just like throwing <laughs> the bullet <laughs> uh, i i think it's good i think you're good at this um <laughs> And we have time too. We have oh, good. Okay. Plenty okay. Of time. All right. Great. Um, what was the last TV show you watched, or what are you currently watching? Um, the last I need. I have a long list of things that I need to catch up on. But the mm-hmm. last one I watched was Big Little Lies, okay, like from great. start to finish. Yes. Can we well, talk about is that it? true? And Feud. Uh huh. Yes. Oh. Yes, the and two Feud. Biggest limited series of the of the yeah. season. Yeah, and I just saw Jessica Langman in that final yeah. episode. Yeah. My God. <laughs> yeah. Who is better than her? I mean, she's incredible As in that episode. As Joan Crawford, like how lucky are Oh my we? God. She's just, she was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And everyone in Big Little Lies. I mean, that was bleak that, I mean, oh, yeah. particularly as an Talk actor to watch that and be like, oh God. Yeah. Um, but she's incredible. And Big Little Lies, that whole, man oh man, that whole cast. Yeah. That show turned into something much different than we all thought it would be, I think. Yeah. We thought it would be a juicy murder mystery and it still kind of was, but. It was, but I loved how, um. I loved how character driven it was. I also loved that you know it was like a little bit of a soap, but like in the best yeah, possible way. Totally. Um, and there's you couldn't get better acting than that. No. No. Amazing. Yeah. Um, this podcast is sponsored by HBO. So how we, convenient! Isn't that convenient that you that named, I said Big Little Lies? You're from an HBO show, and you're talking I am? about Big Little Lies. What am I talking and... about? Um, no, but I legit, you know, I I I watched that show live and i i do mm. appreciate that about hbo that it is still appointment television yeah yeah um and as much as i love to binge watch things because mm-hmm. i do mm-hmm. there is something satisfying about like pacing it out totally. and like waiting for the next episode and yeah and they do create great excitement around their shows mm. which is why you know being a part of girls was was so fulfilling and so exciting because they do there's like this mm. anticipation when the series come out on Absolutely. HBO that yeah yeah you feel it's it's nice and I the like, think pieces start flowing oh onto the internet and who knew there were so, so many, many thinkers out there yeah really yeah a lot of people thinking all the time yeah about poor <laughs> Lena and her oh Jesus writing her life onto the screen as if no one's ever done that before I like, know come on. so critical of, the, of so critical. that woman yeah, yeah. I don't anyway, understand it. Um, this cool. is a very broad question, but oh dear God, what is great acting to you? Um, honesty. Mm-hmm. Honesty is great acting yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah. Just like yeah, I mean, I think that's it. And it's it's harder to do. Speaking as an actor, it's harder to do than one would think. Sure. To police yourself and being, you know, to say like, is this phony? Am I being phony mm-hmm. right now? Mm-hmm. Um. Hmm. But yeah, just honest acting. What do you have planned in terms of between now and the Emmys? Like, do you have any so HBO? Far away. Yeah, like, does HBO have any planned things that you're supposed to do? Or I mean, I think it's some process? things like this. I think that you know we are all again very. It's an honor to be eligible. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. That's so what it is. it's very nice to even be talking about it. But I think that everybody's expectations are you know uh, optimistic but cautious mm. and. Um, no, we're just happy to, and it's also nice to that people still want to talk to us and talk about it because, sure. um, you know, after six years, you never know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you did great work on that show. Thank you. You very deserve much. all of the awards conversations. Ah, well, thank you very much, um, and, and thanks thank for you having so much me for today. taking the time. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew Rannells, everyone.
This episode is brought to you by HBO's original limited series, The Night Of, starring Riz Ahmed and John Turturro. The Night Of delves into the intricate story of a fictitious murder case in New York City, examining the police investigation, the criminal justice system, and the purgatory of Rikers Island where the accused awaits his trial. For your Emmy consideration in Outstanding Limited Series and all other categories. Our next guest, Aubrey Plaza, is a hilarious and talented actor, seen this season on the new FX series Legion, where she plays a crazed supervillain. Although best known for her role as April in NBC's Parks and Recreation, she really shows a new side of herself on this very bizarre, very delightful show. We talked a little bit about her craft and how she created this character, both externally and internally, and many of the different influences that helped create it. It him, her. We talked a little bit about how to gender the character. She's a very talented actor who reinvents herself in every role. Here's my interview with Aubrey Plaza. I'm a huge fan of the show. I'm a huge fan of you. How did you get involved in this, I guess, prestige drama on FX about superheroes? I heard that Noah Hawley was going to cast a middle-aged man. Yeah, he was. Um, I met on the project initially, I think, moving for a different part. Mm -hmm. And um, after that initial meeting, I thought I was going to be, they were going to ask me to audition. And then instead, Noah just asked me for coffee. Mm -hmm. And um, over, over coffee, he pitched me the idea of playing Lenny, which obviously had not occurred to me because the <laughs> script is written for a guy. So I was like, wow, I didn't think about that part. Um, but <laughs> I went back and read it with that in mind. And I just thought it was really interesting. And I thought it'd be really kind of a, just, I thought it was really a cool concept. And I thought that it would be great to work with someone that was able to take a chance on something like that and trust that I could pull it off. Right. Yeah. Well, and when you were doing that first reading, was that just the, for the pilot for the first episode? Yeah, I didn't audition. I didn't actually audition for it. He, it was just like a coffee, but yeah, it was for the, it was for the pilot. And so did you know then what Lenny, because Lenny Busker, he starts as one thing and then he turns into something quite, quite different and evolves throughout the, throughout the season. I mean, did you know that going into it? I knew what Lenny was ultimately. Um, uh-huh. Noah told me that initially he kind of just, I mean, he didn't tell me how I would get there, but oh, he cool, told cool. me the kind of general trajectory of the character. And, and, you know, when I found out what Lenny really was, I wanted to do it immediately. Yeah. So who is this character? How would you describe him or her? <laughs> well, I probably wouldn't use a gender <laughs> so mm-hmm, much. Totally. But um, just because, yeah, just because I, I mean, I, I think the character has human origins. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, so many characters in the Mar- in Marvel universes. Um, but Lenny, Lenny is ultimately a super mutant, a super, you know, villain. And in the show, in this show, um, Lenny is a parasite in mm. David Haller's mind and her motivations have not totally been revealed, but I think we'll find out more mm. about that in season two. That's so exciting. What, what kinds of, did you have different influences that shaped this character, I guess, throughout the process of, of Lenny kind of evolving throughout the season? Yeah. I mean, I did early on have kind of a, David Bowie kind of gender oh, cool. fluid kind of vibe going on. And I remember sending um, Noah texts of some images of Bowie's um, Man Who Sold the, the World album cover where, where he's wearing a dress. And I just like really liked the idea of playing a character that um, can kind of transform into a man and a woman. And that kind of uses both of those female powers and mm. um and male powers in the same way and kind of having that all intertwined. So I thought Bowie was kind of cool. And and I just like really liked just the kind of rock star kind of playful 
vibe mm. um, because I think Lenny is ultimately a really fun character. I mean, Lenny is a villain, but um, mm-hmm. is also David Holler's friend in the beginning. And so I think it was important to kind of have fun and kind of show all sides of the character. And that was a start. That was a jumping off point. But um, as the season went on, I kind of, just started kind of letting my imagination run wild and uh, yeah. coming up with all kinds of different f- physical choices and, um, you know, just in terms of the costumes and the, and the hair, um, I yeah, started going cool. into some weird Beetlejuice territory at the <laughs> end there. Right. Um, How much of the hair and the yeah. makeup was, was you? It was, I mean, it was all me. Um, there was no direction really mm-hmm. in the script about specifically what the hair and makeup uh, or wardrobe should be. The direction was more about kind of the evolution of the, of the characters' phys- physical bodies. Like, mm-hmm. um, you know, towards the end of the season, Lenny starts deteriorating. And there's things in the script that kind of mention that her, her body is kind of disintegrating in a mm-hmm. way. And mm-hmm. she's kind of turning into a more of a monster. But um, in terms of the hair and makeup and the clothes, like that was just a co- collaboration between me and the artist, um, the makeup artist and the, the hairstylist and the um, costume designer. Um, they were really fun to work with and they're really talented. And, um, and that was just kind of, you know, I would go in on days that I wasn't shooting and I would sit with them for hours and we would do different tests and we would just play around and, how to just come up with all kinds of crazy stuff and see what we could get away with. That's awesome. Are you a fan of, uh, did you, do you read comics or was that at all an influence? I, I'm not as um, well read on, on, on comic books as I would like to be. Um, Mm -hmm. But I am a fan of, um, of Marvel movies and superhero movies. So yeah, but I, I'm not, uh, I didn't grow up reading, reading them that much. It just goes back to this, this just, it, it's ingenious casting. Like I don't, there's no other role that you, correct me if I'm wrong. Is there any other role that you've played that's like Lenny? This feels like a very welcome at a left field role for you. No, I mean, that's why I wanted to do it. Yeah. Um, I think coming off of a, of a comedy, you know, sitcom that I was on for seven years, it's, it's really amazing when someone will take a chance on you and, and let you do something totally different. I mean, that's what I want to do at all times, keep doing different things. And it's really hard to find people that will let you do that. Absolutely. Well, and we're at backstage, we're always interested in how actors can maybe even get pigeonholed in their certain types. And you were on the huge successful Parks and Rec for however, that was seven years, right? Yeah. And, and you became a part of our cultural consciousness as, as the stone faced intern April. And, and so, I mean, did you wonder that, did you wonder if roles that you would get after that would resemble her too much or were you consciously trying to find something bigger and different to move on from that? Uh, yes, consciously. I, I mean, I'm always trying to do something different from the last thing that I did. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I think while I was on Parks and Rec, I, um, during my hiatus months, I would always try to do as many films as I could do mm-hmm. um, because I don't like to be doing the same thing all the time. And while I loved being on that show, mm-hmm. um, you know, shooting 22 episodes a year is a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. And so for me to be fulfilled, I need to do more than more than one character a year, I think. Yeah, sure. So I, I think I, I always try to, to um, on my off time from the show, try to do different movies that would allow me to do different parts and hope that I could build a kind of resume that would let mm-hmm. people see that I wasn't just one thing. So mm-hmm. that when the show was over, I just kind of just was like bursting at the seams and just kind of wanted to just shed that character um, badly because I love right. that character so much, but sure. I was, I was ready to be done with it. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, and you mentioned your, your comedy background. I mean, how much of that, that pivoting to something new and something challenging is about training. You studied with, with Upright Citizens Brigade for a long time, right? Yes. I studied with them since I was 19. 
And so do you think it's important to study comedy in general, even even when you're in a drama or even an action adventure drama like Legion? I don't think it really depends on who you are and what you like. I mean, mm-hmm. I was just an improv nerd, you know. I wasn't I wasn't studying improv comedy to help me get other jobs or anything like that. I, I was actually really just focused on the art form. Um, cool. At the time, I was really kind of um, into long form improv. Mm. So, and I just knew that uh, like all the people that I really loved. I mean, well, that's not entirely true. Like, I, I had a really strong desire to be on Saturday Night Live. And uh, okay. so I knew that a lot of people that went on to SNL started out in improv comedy. So <laughs> that was why, that was why, what drew me to the theater to begin with. But then I became really um, kind of a, just obsessed with um, just improv, like long form improv. So, um, but like looking back on it now, I do think that it has helped in so many ways, um, sure. especially with shows, with shows like Legion, because you just have to think on your feet so much and mm. you have to not be afraid to make really bold choices. And I think that's what um, improv comedy really teach, teaches you is to like have no fear and kind of mm. get out of your head and just like go for it, you know? Absolutely. I mean, that was evident in your performance. I'm thinking especially of that incredible dance sequence you had, I think it was in the second to last episode where Lenny just is let loose in the different <laughs> rooms of of his mind. I mean, could you talk about how you approached that? And I feel like you totally approached it with that mentality of, of just fearlessness. Well, in the script, Noah had written a very brief description of that sequence. And mm. it was, I don't want to misquote him, but it was something along the lines of Lenny dances a dance of malevolent joy. <laughs> she rubs her stink all over David's memories. Oh, wow. So it was a very kind of like, whoa, I don't know what, that means <laughs> but that was it so i kind of yeah. i was given like some pr- parameters I was, I was given okay these are the sets that you'll be physically on and that was it so i kind of just let my imagination run wild and i worked with a choreographer and oh, cool. i just kind of decided okay this is like what i want to look like and this is what mm. i'm gonna do and you know i had the song also mm-hmm. the song was in the um in the script so i knew that was sure. that was all i knew i listened to that song probably thousands of times like <laughs> i'm not even kidding like just over <laughs> and over again yeah and um i just tr- i just try to go on like a weird trip oh yeah i mean it was it i i guess it does make sense you worked with a career for because you were there were influences of, of bob fossey and of just general modern yeah. dance and gyrating and it was so awesome <laughs> It's so funny because I'm not a dancer at all. Like, I have no really no training at all. But um, but I do think I am influenced by you know like I'm I was obsessed with Judy Garland growing up, and sure. I love Broadway and musical theater, and so I have I'm sure like all of just all of those things like in my subconscious kind of crept out. I guess. Yeah, I mean that it really felt like a moment where a subconscious is may, is being manifest and. It's very cool to hear that <laughs> Judy Garland is part of that. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Judy Garland is Lenny Busker. Judy Garland is everything. So awesome. I want to ask, too, about the, the press that you do and the process it takes to promote, especially a new show. Um, I'm all, we're always curious about how, if someone wants to promote their project on TV, there's so much TV out there. What steps do you take? Um, what kinds of coverage does that entail? And who do you work with to get Legion and to get Lenny, I guess, out there into the world? You with, mean like a publicist? Yeah, you work with a team of publicists. And do you guys sit down to plan out uh, what kind of coverage you'd like? Well, I do have a publicist. And <laughs> we don't, I mean, it's, it's funny. Like, I actually don't know how it works. I just do whatever they tell me to do. <laughs> cool, um, cool. I think they, I think it depends on the project, but I think, and it depends on how things are received and the interest in, in it. And Mm -hmm. I think we've been lucky that people really responded to Legion. So people want to talk about it and they want to cover it. So um, if that starts happening, then we just kind of go for it. Um, But, but I have some, I have independent films coming out that I produced this summer and 
for those movies, we definitely sit down and we decide like, this is what we want to do. And this gotcha. is what we'll try to do. And these are, these are our goals. And, you know, but you're always at the mercy of, you know, the talk shows and the magazines and the, <laughs> the, on the online pu- publications, because sure. you, know, you can only promote, you can only do so much. You have to have the, um, demand for it, I guess. Right. And sometimes maybe you're promoting like a bigger or a big name project, but also trying to plug those smaller independent film type projects, correct? Yeah. I mean, I love independent films and so much. And you've done so many. Those are the hardest things. I know. I can't stop doing it. I just, (laughs) as you should. It's hard to get people to go see those, you know? People don't (laughs) like to go to the movie theaters anymore unless it's for like some big, super big franchise movie. It's true. Which is ironic because TV technically takes up more of our time, but it does seem like just everybody wants to watch television these days. I know, but that's why I like Legion because it feels like an eight hour movie. Mm. And I want to ask you, like, what is your, you've been to many awards shows. What is your relationship with awards and do you think about them? And is that kind of part of the planning process when you're promoting your projects? No, I never think about awards because I Mm -hmm. feel like that would be a bad path to go down <laughs> like, like caring sure. about that but like but I mean I think awards are really helpful I think awards kind of give people credibility and they kind of give people they kind of push people to another level and um they can really be helpful so I mean I love awards like give me an award yeah. please <laughs> um but not not because I care about awards but mainly just because yeah. I because if that's you know if that's an ind- indicator that you know people would want to work with me, then I'll take it. I mean, I just want to work with really talented um, directors and writers. And it's really hard to, it's really hard to, you know, get noticed. So I think like awards are great for actors because it gets them noticed and hopefully by people that want to work with them. So for me, that's what all the press and all that stuff is really about. It's just, it's just about kind of keeping that visibility so that you can, you can work more work ha- and have more control over your career ultimately. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So I'm going to ask a series of quick questions and you can answer okay. as you will and answer from the gut. I was going to ask you to answer as Lenny, but, but I think that we should probably not let Lenny into this interview. Mm, Lenny is in the hibernation right now. <laughs> <laughs> as he should be. Yeah. I would be pretty scared to talk to Lenny, I think. Yeah, I would not trust her. <laughs> um, all right. As of this moment, who is your favorite actor? Oh, as of this <laughs> moment, I mean, I'm gonna say Sarah Paulson uh-huh. because I Excellent. just I'm so late to the I'm so late to the to the show whatever the party, but I just finished the mm-hmm. O.J. Simpson show. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I like really just finished it, and I thought she was amazing. So she's like on the, on my mind right now. So is that the last, my next question was last TV show you watched? Is it People vs. OJ? That was the last thing I watched, but I did also just rewatch Twin Peaks to get ready for the uh-huh. new yeah. season. So I've been, my brain has been very filled with disturbing images. <laughs> That's great. And going off of that, like when was the last time you saw something in a TV show? Maybe even when you're rewatching a show like Twin Peaks, like that, that just made you sit up and go, that is an amazing moment or an amazing performance. Ooh, I mean, hmm. I mean, Twin Peaks is like the whole show is I, made up of that those first moments. season. It, I mean, the whole show is amazing, but the first season is. I what I thought was really cool about it is it's eight episodes, so he mm-hmm. really kind of did that eight episode limited series before anyone else. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. he did it a long time ago. So, I mean, he's a genius, but, um, but that, that whole show is amazing. And I did think that, that those performances are insane, but it's hard to choose just one. I mean, I can kind of see how that show's acting style and that show itself might be an influence on you. I, that kind of makes sense to me, <laughs> if I may say. Yeah. I mean, I love David Lynch. I mean, yeah. he's, one of my favorite filmmakers of all time. Um, like Wild at Heart, I think is one of the best movies ever. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I, I think, yeah. And I also think I did actually feel like when I was watching that first season that I felt a lot of Legion um, mm. influence. Sure. Too. Like just 
just kind of like that kind of disturbing vi- like vibe and um yeah. and like a lot of like really pra- practical kind of scary practical effects like there's something very grounded about that both of those shows even though they're kind of you know supernatural um so what this is such a broad question but what is great acting to you mm. <laughs> This is always the tricky one. Great acting. Great acting to me is just when you can tell that the person has no awareness at all of what, of how they're being perceived or something like it's just, it's Mm. just when you, when you watch someone that is not embarrassed to humiliate themselves Mm, in any way and they just (laughs) go for it, you know, people that really go for it. I mean, for me, that's the best is when you just watch someone that just dies off the deep end and that just gets real weird. I love that because I think you can sense sometimes when people are, are aware of the camera or aware of themselves or don't want to look stupid or, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, there's, you can feel that and you can feel it the other way too. And you watch someone that you just know is just completely disappeared into their character. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time and for talking to us about Legion, this amazing show. Fingers crossed it gets a million bajillion Emmy nominations. Yeah, I hope so. That would be so fun. I would love it. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, thanks for having me. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. That was Aubrey Plaza. You can hear more from our interview with her and with Andrew Rannells in a later episode where we're going to break down all of the advice that they gave backstage readers and backstage listeners. I thought that was a really great interview. I was particularly interested in her talking about her character development and the involvement she had in it and how Mm. she helped develop it visually as well as sort of... Yeah, outside in almost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she had a lot of different influences and that actually went into the construction of the character itself and the script. Yeah. In fact, Andrew had the same thing. He and Mm. Lena Dunham work almost anecdotally, and they all collaborate together with that team of writers to craft stories that are based on real experiences. And that's the sort of dream of a lot of actors is to be able to have that creative input, you know, rather than just be told Mm -hmm. where to stand and what to wear and what to say. They actually have a say, and their personality informs the writers and their yeah, performance informs so cool. the director and the writer and things. Yeah, it's pretty Which pretty says a lot about TV and the state mm. of, it just seems like a lot of these particularly cable shows give actors and other artists that collaborative power. And they have that flexibility to adapt. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Awesome. Great stuff. Great stuff in this episode. Good job. Um, thank you. Good job to you as well. Should we uh, roll the credits? Roll the credits. Roll the credits. Be sure to like, rate, and subscribe for more interviews from the front lines of the 2017 Emmy race. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City. Special thanks this week to Andrew Rannells and Aubrey Plaza for joining us. Thanks, as always, to producer, editor, and podcast whiz Jamie Muffet. And to the most trusted name in casting, Backstage, Peter Rappaport, Ryan Remstad, Jesse Balashek, Francis Ramos, Rowan Al-Khatib, and especially the brilliant Casey Howe. For more awards and industry coverage, head over to Backstage.com. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week for another glimpse in the envelope.